Good afternoon. Welcome to HKDI Inspired Design for Wellbeing 2020 online master lecture series. Some of you may know that this is the third edition of HKDI Inspire lecture series. The first two in the first two series in 2018 and 2019 focused on design thinking. And this year we hope to delve deeper into the people-centric aspect of design and design thinking in enhancing human well-being, especially in turbulent times when we face the challenges of the global pandemic, the aging population, etc. Today, we are honored to have invited Professor Lynn Corner, Chief Operating Officer of UK National Innovation Centre and Director of Voice, and Dr. Yang Ki Lee, co-founder of Enable Foundation Hong Kong, as our speakers. The lectures will be followed by a sharing by Mr. Michael Chen, HKDI Head of Academic Development, who would also moderate our panel discussion with Professor Corner and Dr. Lee afterwards. You are more than welcome to leave your questions for our speakers using the text chat function of the Zoom video webinar or post them on HKDI Facebook Live. Without further ado, I shall pass the virtual stage to Professor Corner to deliver her keynote, Harnessing Human Experience for Healthy Aging. Hello, my name is Professor Lynn Corner and I am Director of Voice and the Chief Operating Officer of the UK's National Innovation Centre for Ageing, an initiative from UK Government and Newcastle University. It is a real pleasure to join you all today and I am honoured to be part of the fabulous programme looking at design for wellbeing. As a bit of background, our job is to harness the business opportunities related to longevity economies through human experience, ethics, data, collaboration, emerging technologies and innovative business models. Our mission? To add intelligence to ageing and longevity. We strongly believe that if there is one thing the world needs today, it's intelligence. And if we as humanity needed any evidence, the events brought to us by COVID-19 along this tough year gave us the most tangible and dramatic example. Intelligence is everywhere. It's driven by human genius and hunger for progress, evolving and advancing as we push the boundaries of what is possible. Daily new discoveries and interventions demonstrate the extraordinary brilliance of people to create tools and solutions which were unimaginable just a few years earlier. Intelligence is in data from research, but from a myriad of different initiatives and projects, current, past and future. And intelligence is also in human experience, shared knowledge and wisdom. It's found in emotions, in deep insights, in what people and their loved ones communicate, feel, want and need. These are crucial yet disparate and largely imperceptible fragments of knowledge collected over the phases of our lifetime. But imagine if we integrated these different sources of intelligence and had the power to harness people's lived experience, amplify greater understandings of people's aspirations and desires, and merge the strengths and capabilities of different generations and cultures. This is what we do. We call it ageing intelligence. Um, it's a branded approach which aims to combine our research background, expertise and understanding the correlation between market demands, industry dynamics and people's needs, applying it with the latest in artificial intelligence and evidence from big data, alongside what I consider the key intelligence, human experience. So by harnessing the immense wisdom, insights and experience of citizens and their stakeholders, we aim to rapidly translate this intelligence to co-create, to design, develop and bring to market products and services that are urgently needed across the world to help people live healthier and better, longer lives. So why is that needed and needed now? Well, we're here in the midst of a global pandemic and this of course impacts communities, all communities and economies across the world. Our neighborhoods, our family and friends, all of us as individuals. The pandemic has highlighted just how interconnected we all are and need to be and has put a spotlight firmly on what we value in our lives and what is important to our financial, physical and our mental well-being. This is primarily about people and what is fundamental is how we choose to develop, design and shape our environments, our everyday consumer products and services based on what different people need, want and desire at different points in their life 
tailored to their specific circumstances. To ensure that people across our planet can have choices to be resilient and make the most of the incredible possibility of extensions in life expectancy. Because we are living longer, um, by 2050, and COVID will undoubtedly change this further, we already have signals and changes in life expectancy ratios, but many regions and cities already are and will continue to undergo profound changes with significant shifts in populations, median age and composition. These demographic transitions and indeed transformations of more than 2 billion people over 60 by 2050 will of course offer both opportunities and challenges. So we'll have to understand much more about the diverse and often contrasting patterns of population growth, where and how people are living with fundamental differences in urban and rural areas. And of course, we have widening inequalities globally and regionally, huge strains on the planet's sustainability. So approaches which put both citizen and planet well-being first and foremost increasingly matter. In terms of well-being and longevity, we, we must plan and design not for oldness per se, but for through life well-being and longevity. A focus on well-being is really important. It, put, it focuses on health and wealth and inequalities, and it puts this at the centre of policy and economy and of innovation and shapes what we value and why. When we focus on well-being, we start a conversation about what really matters in our life. What do we value in the communities we live in? What type of world do we want? A focus on well-being is compelling as it also encourages a longer-term view and embraces the complexity and interconnectedness that is our world today. It's arguably a much better measurement of a society's wealth and success than gross domestic product, GDP, which is limited. Of course, economic growth and recovery is vitally important, but as important is people's happiness, having choice, fairer health and building resilience. For example, in the context of work, um, well-being economies value fair work and pay that is meaningful and fulfilling, not just the total number of jobs created. And so for thousands of unpaid carers, often women, the world over, this matters. At the National Innovation Centre, we call this a return on society. But governments are also taking an interest. The New Zealand government um, in 2019 published a treasury-led economic strategy for growth, the wellbeing budget, putting citizen wellbeing at the heart of the treasury and therefore all government policy. Mental and physical wellbeing was crucially not assigned to departments of health and social care, but considered to be absolutely central to the country's economic success and prosperity. This included record investment in tackling mental illness, mild depression and anxiety, looking at family violence and child poverty, with billions dedicated to reducing inequalities and ministers across all departments instructed to design policies which specifically improve well-being. So the message here is clear that well-being is not just a consequence of policy, but must be the focus of policy, as a country's economic prosperity and productivity depend on it being high. And this challenges current thinking. This model is not simply about reorganising health and social care. Much health and social care reorganisation has been for the benefit of the organisation rather than the impact on the public. And this model also emphasises different aspects of health and social care delivery. So services in this model that were perhaps the poor relation become mainstream. Carers and mental health take centre stage. In terms of health as well, looking at the link between diseases rather than single conditions is a new frontier. For if we can prevent and delay, if we can predict and intervene early, how much very different would our health and services um, and our healthcare be? And this is where we certainly need more innovation to focus. It's not merely assistive technology that we need to design and deliver, but predictive technology, and crucially, the importance for services to be able to deal with this. Healthy aging starts early. There are places where people live in the world already. They live exceptionally long, healthy lives with markedly low rates of chronic disease. These include Sardinia, uh, Costa Rica, Okinawa, and Japan, um, and places in Greece. 
Of course, there's no single ingredient, but people in these places were characterized by healthier lifestyles, um, a diet with little processed food, daily strenuous exercise, strong enduring friendships, low stress, and lots of sleep. And critically, a sense of ikaigai, roughly translated as a reason for being, so purpose and meaning to their lives. And you get ikaigai at the place where your values intersect with what you enjoy doing, what you're good at. So of course, this, this emphasis is going to have to change our concepts of what constitutes older age and necessitates through life approaches and planning. Changing the nature of society, changing attitudes, um, the nature of public services, and making the most of new science and emerging technologies in a range of sectors for education, to change the way we work, learn, socialize, and communicate. So how do we ensure that people through life make the most of their abilities with a sense of purpose and role? How do we address the massive underutilization of citizens' mental capital? And crucial to this as well is generations thriving together listening to citizens and valuing their experience. So on that note, uh, meet our community of innovation active citizens through uh, an organization called VOICE. Uh, VOICE is an international network of citizens um, supported by an online digital platform. People of all ages and backgrounds, and we are able through VOICE to harness and leverage the immense wisdom, the experience, the expertise, the insights, the contributions of citizens, especially older citizens and their stakeholders, families and carers, exchanging their intelligence and background. Our incredible citizens from Voice ensure that we can illustrate real people's needs in real circumstances and understand what is important to them and their families, rather than basing development on abstract personas, which often perpetuate ageist myths, assumptions, and stereotypes. Just imagine how much wisdom, insight, and experience is locked in this massive group of people. Imagine how much intelligence. This is enormous human capital. And ageing is an enormous emerging market and challenge. It is the world's third biggest economy. And there are various statistics around saying how many trillions of dollars this market is worth, but certainly it is huge and it's untapped. And on track to generate half of all urban consumption growth between 2015 and 2030. Older adults dominate spending in 119 of 123 consumer packaged goods categories. So the fact we are living longer changes almost every aspect of life from the food we buy and eat to work to education, all sectors are affected. And this is a massive opportunity for designers to contribute, to help create a market with desirable, aspirational, fun products, which are needed, but with the purpose of creating well-being right across the life course. It is time we challenge our own ageist language and ageist stereotypes and assumptions, our own ageist attitudes. Where are these people in today's narrative of brands and organizations? Do we see them? Are they visible? Not only do these do the, do the wisdom and ability of older people and injustice, but ageist assumptions cloud people's minds to the possibilities and limit innovative thinking. So our mantra is focused not on the what is, but to ask what if. And the opportunity to do that is now. There is plenty of evidence about what is needed. The real challenge is making it happen. So let me talk through some examples of where we have taken a real challenge identified by the public, by voice members, and worked with a range of businesses and organizations to uh, deliver products and solutions to meet the challenges identified. First of all, um, financing longer, healthy lives will obviously require very different approaches to education, to planning longer lives, and new models for lifelong learning, uh, different approaches to work and financing for pensions and care. So we have partnered with LifeFeed to deliver life-based education via e-learning platforms to employees who are already providing care whilst also working to put a real value on their caring skills and experience. In terms of the future mobility, 
um, our built environment, our homes and communities and the products and services we use and access every day have not necessarily been designed with ageing populations in mind. And so this is an opportunity to enable people to live safe, independent and socially connected lives. Voice members and the older people we work with identified mobility as really important and particularly their confidence to being key. What they said was they needed an understanding of the user journey from beginning to end. And if any point this journey was interrupted, people often decided not to make the journey at all. So we work on train and station design to make sure that the person is able to visualize and plan each stage of their journey using a range of wearables and technologies. And this is really reassuring. And then we can monitor that journey to identify further areas for future improvement. And can I introduce Jita, a beautifully designed personal assistant cargo carrying robot developed by Piaggio Fast Forward. We are exploring how Jita can support vulnerable and self-isolating citizens to continue to shop, to travel and to keep mobile in a touch-free, socially distanced way. In a COVID recovering world, the need to self-isolate has to be balanced with the benefits of continuing to keep fit with walking every day especially recommended. So in terms of changing the urban landscape, voice members identified street furniture as an area that they particularly wanted to see improvement. So this is the Vitality Bench. This has been designed with over 40 separate design features, including longer handles for increased grip, a higher ground clearance for people with mobility issues, and a more upright back. Phase two will encompass the latest artificial intelligence and wayfinding techniques to understand through data people's preferences and behaviours. Of course, most of the world's population live in cities and urban areas, and so designing our cities to support healthy ageing is crucial. This is our home, the award-winning Catalyst Building in Newcastle, which has been co-designed to support healthy ageing and be a multi-generational workplace with design input from voice members, many themselves retired designers and architects. We currently have on display the four gen kitchen designed to enable cross-generational living with four generations utilizing the same space. Healthy aging, we've said, is a life course approach and begins early. And there is huge potential to personalize people's understanding of their own aging and how their lifestyle influences their own aging trajectory. Most services, as an example, have evolved rather than being designed to specifically address well-being and to make the most of the opportunities of longer, healthier lives. There's plenty of evidence from the public health community about what approaches might work. Um, for example, smoking control, healthier food, alcohol control, uh, more physical activity, improving social relationships. But these are failing to have a long-term sustained impact on behavior change in the communities which experience the worst levels of ill health. And so this is an app from a company based in the National Innovation Center, Changing Health, which is specifically designed to personalize advice and support and monitor behavior change. The focus initially is on diabetes. Um, 415 million people globally live with diabetes. So it's a major challenge and responses to prevent diabetes are very much needed. A note on the importance of care and carers. Um, while um, many older people are reaching later life in better shape than ever before, age is a risk factor for many age-related conditions such as heart disease, cancer and dementia and many people experience multiple conditions. There are a huge opportunities to design and develop a range of products and services that can help families to manage and prevent these conditions, to continue to live independently and to better coordinate care and often provide remote care. So the question was, how can we best connect people and generations together, given it how essential it is for people to have support, um, service design and delivery in this space is really, really important. 
So this is on hand, um, a fabulous mobile care application harnessing the power of volunteering. It's a wonderful way to engage generations in supporting people who simply need a little bit of help now and then. It's been hugely successful in London and it's now being piloted in Newcastle and elsewhere. Dementia is a global challenge um, and this is Virtual Leap which brings virtual reality for early stage dementia sufferers. So through brain gaming software, this enables people with dementia to experience different realities, but in an entertaining way. It's a way of matching different technologies to meet a need to support communication with people with dementia. So extended longevity among our populations is casting profound implications for aging and well-being in healthcare systems for decades to come. If we are to prosper and thrive in a changing society and in an increasingly interconnected and competitive world, both our mental and material resources, harnessing our human intelligence will be vital. What remains fundamental is how we develop, design and shape our environments, our everyday consumer products and services, based on what different people need and desire, not based on age per se, but on focusing and maximising what people are able and want to do, rather than emphasising what they can't. This is where design can have a fundamental role. Products and services are needed that not only meet functional needs, but are desirable and aspirational. There is renewed interest in well-being economies and in people's through life emotional and mental well-being, focusing on how to help people manage transitions to thrive, to pursue existing and develop new hobbies and interests at all stages of life. So join us in making it happen, in delivering ageing intelligence and in leveraging the wisdom, the experience, the expertise and insights of the public, older adults together with their stakeholders to ensure that people wherever they live can have more opportunity to make the most of these healthier, longer lives. After all, encouraging and enabling everyone to realise their potential throughout their life is central to all our future prosperity and all our future well-being. Now let's get connected with Dr. Yankee Lee for her lecture, Designed by People for People. Hi, Yankee, can you hear us? Hello. Yeah, I can. Uh, need to, uh, I need to share my screen. Also, oops, need to change this. Yeah, can I hear you? Can I share my screen? Yeah. Sure, please go ahead. Yeah. Cool. Hi everyone, and um, thank you, Linz, for a very inspiring talk. Um, so this is my turn. Um, so after a very big context of what's happening in aging as much more a global and phenomenon, um, so I want to tell you guys or share with you guys a bit more on how we actually do it on the field. So as a design researcher, how can we actually put this global uh, issues into our own practice. Um, so I'm Yanki, I am a visiting professor in Linnaeus University in Sweden and also running my own um, design uh, agency and also an education charity. Um, so I just give you some ideas where I come from. So I study architecture um, in Hong Kong and then in London, but then I think the most important of my work is two very important um, mentor, uh, which is they are all really uh, changing about the landscape of design and aging. So the first one is Dr. Patricia Moore, which is uh, an industrial designer from America, uh, doing this like immersive experience of uh, her own practice and thinking about who are being excluded by design. And I think this is something I always talking to my student in design school. This is a very inspirational experience and is also a rethinking for a professional like designers. 
And also um, back to Lin's uh, example from the UK. Um, so Professor Roger Coleman was the first uh, professor talking about aging and design and his program called Design Age was very successful happening in the late 90s at the Royal College, which is uh, where all the people haven't really think about this. And he'll be starting to talk about this of how, how can we design for our future self. So I think what my talk is really about, um, I was talking directly to designer, design student, that hope you guys can really think about what you can do in this big global phenomenon. So I think it's really good that because I was after Linz because she gave a very good context of what happening. So this is definitely important. But a lot of people like Roger and Patricia have been talking it for over like 20, 30 years now. But it's still, a lot of designers is still doing what they think is cool, but doesn't really think about the elderly or our future self. So, um, we have set up a company or a design, social design collective called Enable Foundation, which is actually very echo from what Linz was talking about, this stuff like creative citizenship. So we believe designers is a profession, but at the same time, we need a lot of creative citizens to come to join us to co-create, co-design together. Because I always say to my students, even though I'm like in my late 40s, but I'm still not old enough to talk about aging compared to someone who is in the 80s. So there's a lot of what Linz was talking about, this stuff like social capital and also this stuff like aging intelligence, which are like really much the term that we can really help us to think about together about our future aging. Um, so in the in Liberal Foundation, we do a lot the work about social design research and more important I think as a designers we all want to be implements so I, I'm glad that to see Glynn's have provided some example which have some of the ideas have been implemented in the city but that is not always the case so that's also something I think for design students it's really exciting to see something really doing in their own, own city and become implementing in our own society. Um, so we as an education charity and also a social design collective working with a lot of designers and also different people from different backgrounds, from financial background, from uh, social innovation background. So it's a really, uh, hopefully become a collective to bring many people working together. Um, so we, as a design company, we are not a, a commercial like uh, entity. We work with funding. So uh, we've been really lucky since we started in 2017, we have been receiving uh, social innovation from, from Hong Kong government and working on what we call social innovation design lab is a cross generation and cross disciplinary lab that bringing uh, different people, different Hong Kong citizens working together on our future aging. So we call aging innovation for the future. So we're looking at like death, like dying, burial, service. We're looking at dementia and also looking at how we can bring uh, many people together to think about the productive aging, which is what Linz was talking about, this voice like initiative sounds really f f fascinating that they can draw 8,000 people together, which is something I think Hong Kong really need to draw uh, more citizens coming working together. So this is my honor to speak here again because I was here last year and talking about design thinking and also about design thinking is not a magic button, but then actually something to thinking about the future of innovation. Um, but instead of just thinking about design thinking, I think I, what I encouraged last year, designer, design student, um, need to thinking about how we actually use design as a social practice. How can we actually practice in design with ourselves, but also including other citizens? And I think this is what Enable Foundation being really, really focusing on and how to bring in this design way of living in our Hong Kong very prac and very stressful society. Um, so this year we've been working on a new project also funded by the social innovation funds from Hong Kong government. Uh, it's called Dementia Hong Kong, which I'm going to talk about a bit more later. Um, so the, the whole philosophy of uh, an AU foundation is designed by people for people, which is, I think, something quite subtle, but then is very spot on after many years, over 20 years of experience of my work in user research, in social innovation, and how can we actually working with people and how can we bring people together, which I think this is what my talk is really 
uh, trying to bring to our student, which is telling them how exactly we can do it with people. If, if they are designing, why aren't my designers? How can this be happening? Um, so historically, I think there have been a lot of talking about design and people, but of course, historically designer, even nowadays, there's still a lot of star designers, star architects, they don't really think about people because they design from their own perspective for the client, for their future imagination, which is great. They are very exciting design, but at the same time, there have been a school, there's an, a, a stream of designers have been really have this self-reflection who are we actually designed for? Um, so there have been a really famous book by Harry Sandsforce that talk about designing for people, which is the first time talking about design and people, how to define this relationship between those being designing and those being using the design. But then um, there has been a long, so this book is published in the 60s, so it has been a classic industrial design book. And I think it's very, still very influential. I think if you're talking to industrial designer and or traditional more like product designer, they're still thinking about, okay, let's designing for people. And, but this has been challenged and have especially recently about this of citizenships coming into design. And so for example, Singapore participate in design, they have published a book about designing with people, which is something is currently really popular and also something have been influencing a lot of designers, especially the younger generation. Why are we designing what we were doing here? So I think designing with people is not just for them, but it's actually with them together. So it's an opening up of our design process. Um, I also did a research project uh, funded by the EPSLC in, in London that we're also looking at this of designing, designing with people. How can we actually do it? Because it sounds like very easy, but actually how can we opening up our professional practice into the real world and bringing everyone into the process, which is always unexpected. And how can we deal with all different people from different age, different race, different gender? How can we bring them into our design process? Um, so this is something my talk today is about, is a reflection or rethinking that I hope um, you guys can help and working together for the coming practice. So how can we look at design for with by people, which is have been a long, long discussion in the design research community. So it's a, it's a methodology. So, okay, we agree that we are care about people. We are designer. We are a very good designer, really social concern. But at the same time, how are we actually working in the field? How can we actually design for people, with people, or even by people? This is something I hope that everyone remember, at least after this talk, Am I designing for them or with them or by them? So um, this is really come back to Enable Foundation, the how we're going to set up and how we actually working in Hong Kong um, as a social design collective. We're bringing different designers together. Um, so, but also we very interesting in bringing citizens into the design process. So for example, looking at dying, that we're bringing 300 young people and 100 older citizens in Hong Kong. And together we go out to look at the green barrier methods that have been suggested, have been pi like pioneered by our government to really looking at the new way of burial our ancestors. And also looking at how we can actually together looking at active elderly or active elders, we call them, that they can bring us more information about aging in Hong Kong, which there's not enough information because it's, it's evolving and also been changing every five years and this new generation coming in and things are moving so fast in Hong Kong. What is aging in Hong Kong mean? I think there's a lot of work have been doing um, in the social science part and how can design respond to all this data? Um, but more important, we've been really working a lot on dementia, which is we're bringing uh, people with dementia, but more important with the carers and the service provider to working with young people to really understand this disease at the same time to how can we prepare ourselves to living in a super aging society with a lot of people with dementia. So this is a video I want to show.
Since 2017, Enable Foundation has engaged the public to empathise and understand the world of dementia. We call it Dementia Land. This Turn It On Corner aims to invite the public to experience what might happen if dementia were to affect our capacity of judgement. People living with dementia might have an illusion and see many switches which would be very difficult for us to imagine. Think what it might be like going into a bathroom and not seeing anything, just an empty room, or perhaps all the objects appeared upside down. It sounds really scary, but this is what we've heard from carers, that it might be like for some people living with dementia. The consequence is that they might either refuse to go in or pee on the floor. People living with dementia may also perceive the world very differently. For example, objects moving by themselves. A carer told us that somebody living with dementia was holding onto a broom for more than 10 minutes. By interacting with this moving broom, try to clear the rubbish. We hope that you can feel the frustration of those who are living with dementia on a problem or just coordinating a simple everyday task. Another common symptom of dementia is that people may have difficulties understanding simple tasks such as getting dressed, putting a jacket on. Where's the sleeve? Which buttons are correct? I'm just completely lost here. Project Dementia Going's key message is to invite everybody to let go. In autumn 2019, Enable Foundation was invited by the Centre for Demens in Copenhagen to explore the Danish version. The centre is providing physical and cognitive training to Copenhagen citizens. Thanks to the support from the staff in the centre, there are a lot of stories from Copenhagen citizens who are living with dementia, which can translate into objects of dementia. And these dementia objects were put into everyday tasks and we invited users to test them. In this collaboration, we further explored how design research can work on the topic of dementia. We engaged the public at a huge cultural event and we asked the question, what if everyday objects and even the city became demented? Since 2015, the design research team from Enable Foundation has collaborated with different international and Hong Kong creative agents, social service experts and organisations to co-create a series of design actions, including objects, installations, videos, workshops, and lots more. In order to discuss our insights, we created five Enable Dementia Jackets. We hope to bring this insight and these questions to design communities to explore together the potential of reframing dementia, not as a loss, but as a culture to be embraced. This is what it must feel like if you're demented, that you don't know where your sleeve is and you don't understand the jacket, so you get all mixed up. So for me, it empathizes with people who have dementia. That's how it works. I think that the Dutch Design Week has a very important feeling that there is a lot of people who are in the world who are in the world who are in the world who are in the world. 就好簡單，我哋即係好開心得到個認同，亦都覺得成個 approach 係誒得到好多人嘅支持，特別係市民啦，一般市民嘅支持咯
Okay, so I think the video really telling you what we have done um, in the past two years. Uh, we're focusing on dementia as a culture, but I think the target, maybe maybe some of you may be thinking, will that all the objects will be making people with dementia really confused? No, this is all the tools you saw in this video is for general public, which is you guys, which is people have no dementia or even not even know about dementia, not even care about dementia. So it's a really empathic tools for general public, especially for young people to engage, to think about dementia in a different way. So this is for us is really important because it's not about making a solution for people with dementia. And I like Lin's for talking about this of VR for training. But from our experience in Hong Kong, VR training have been a big problem in social service because they can be stimulating too much like, um, like bad feeling and also people with dementia are different. So I think this is something, an uh, interesting design discussion, how far we want to use technologies or just a demented um, uh, apron being, being used, being so popular in Copenhagen that many citizens really love to use it in order to understand dementia. So this is a really, I think it's a very much more in-depth design discussion and how far we can want to go. So this is why I bring brought up to the question of that, what we do, I think is really about design research and how to use design to conduct new way of research and finding new finding. So design research is not just online research, it's really about action. It's about, about making changes and making social change with the people we're working with, the stakeholders. So it's not about just like posting notes, making like people talking together, but it's really also it's not about just interview, but it's really about research and this action changing and uh, engaging people in a different way. And this is why you saw the video that we think a lot of way to engage different people because we know everyone are different. So people going to a shopping mall to see a housing uh, exhibition and then they find really exciting to go into a demented home which is a show flat to showing people different symptoms of dementia or making a series of jacket that people can try on to think about dementia in a different way. So this is what I think a really good pro about what design research is. It's great design, great, great design. Great research, great, great design. Design researcher carefully investigates human experience and behavior. And I think the most important part is we dream up new ways to spark and distill insight and inspire team and clients to address people's needs through bold and optimistic design. I think this is something really get into the, the nitty gritty of how we actually do it using design to address social change. And I think this is something I hope some people here today, especially our students, um, I know that some of the students have been working with us in the summer school. I really hope you're rethinking what have you done in the summer. This is what we want you to learn from our summer school. So for us, it's so important that we very clear that we are different discipline. So doctors, government will talk about good death. We need some way, new way to think about. So we talk about fine dying, which is a designer way of working. When government charity WHO talk about age-friendly city, which is great, been talking about over 20 years time, but this doesn't seem something new or exciting. A lot of general public don't really care about it. So what we did is we have initiated the old school, which is something we think that is important. If we have kindergarten for children, we should have old school for everyone to learn about aging. But also for dementia, that also talk about so much about dementia friendly city, which is a, a, a lot of them sometimes become a slogan and then people doesn't really care. So how can we actually think about a new way? So this is why we call dementia land. So is it something we as a designer want to offer as a new perspective to working with social workers, government, medical experts together? How can we can make dementia friendly city much more lively, much more motivated for people, general public to understand it and being part of it. Look at this, it's like a 
。我喺二零一五年有个机会认识咗赛马会旗志源服务中心嘅 Florence。喺討論跨界別合作期間，指導中心其實喺二零一三年已經開始自制一系列嘅道具，目的係俾照顧者同大眾體驗一下老退化人士每日喺生活上面遇到嘅困難。於是，我同學院入面嘅設計研究小組，連同其志源團隊一齊研究設計咗兩套其二旅程教材。喺同其志源第一次合作過程。令到我哋设计师联想到脑退化症状同魔术之间嘅联系，当中灵感重点来自 perception， 意思系我哋点样去感知呢个世界。当脑部出现退化嘅症状嘅时候，眼前见到嘅世界就好似被施咗魔法一样唔同晒。假如设计师可以同护理专业合作，了解脑退化人士生活上嘅小细节，再将不同物件、空间甚至城市。用魔术手法将佢哋脑退化咗，就能吸引更多人一齐去探索脑退化症嘅世界。实在脑退化症同年青人距离太远啦，如果屋企人冇呢个病，就好少接触，亦都漠不关心。咁二零一九年咧，我哋就誒、呃、認識咗 Center for Dementia， 咁佢哋其實就喺丹麥 Copenhagen 城市入邊一個專門負責誒俾、呃、初期誒、呃、diagnose 咗誒、呃、腦退化症嘅市民咧，去做一啲 training 嘅 cognitive training， 即係腦部嘅一啲誒、呃、training 啦。咁誒佢哋睇咗我哋之前一啲老化嘅物件啊，一啲短片啊，甚至城市成個誒。呃系列嘅設計研究啲一啲工具啦，咁我哋就傾傾下，就話不如咁啦，我哋試下嘗試去設計一套、呃、一套新嘅認識腦退化症嘅工具，就特別咧係俾誒 Copenhagen 嘅市民去參與嘅。咁所以咧就今次真係咧用呢個老化古仔開始，咁就好多謝 c e n t e r 嗰啲 staff members 啦，佢哋揾咗好多關於當地一啲腦退化症。呃、市民啦，佢哋屋企人啦嘅一啲生活小,小趣事啊，或者佢哋遇到一啲困難啦，或者佢哋一啲佢哋自己解決腦退化症嘅方法，就同我哋一齊去分享。跟住咧，就一齊設計咗五套咧，係重新認識腦退化症嘅工具。咁亦都喺啱啱十月咧，就喺誒喺佢哋嘅誒 City Hall 入邊咧，做咗一個好大型嘅 testing 啦，亦都得到好多一啲好有用嘅一啲誒 comments 啦。咁所以而家咧就再誒 modify 緊，希望咧真係可以將來喺下年咧就推出喺佢哋 Copenhagen 嘅一啲 community 嗰度咧，令到更多人可以感受到呢一套工具。Okay, so I think this is just I want to show this because I want my student, and which I met like over the summertime, to really understand what this is about. And then it, <coughs> speaking in Chinese and also seeing the actual tools, it will be very helpful for them. And so I think this brings to the next topic, which is about design and empathy. I think for us, there have been a long discussion about the designer role in a lot of these social issues. I think for us, one thing is about empathy. How can we actually empathize though being excluded by design and also being excluded by society in general? How can we、uh, empathizing with people with dementia and older people in general? So I think this is what we mean. The amplifying the words have been used a lot in design thinking has part of the five main key role. But actually, how can we do it? So we bring in this of course、um, generation and cross disciplinary co creation together to working with these empathy ideas.、Um, so what we've been working with a lot with medical and social expert is this、um, medical model and social model, and we see ourselves have a new perspective, which is we call the cultural model of aging. Which is how can we work with the medical expert and social workers, social service provider to、uh, develop a new culture of aging that bringing different generation of people to think about aging, but not about the elderly, but it's not designed for the elderly, but it's actually create like this a new culture for our future. So putting ourselves into this aging discussion, so we are all part of the aging, and so for us is. 
a lot of the medical model will look at social at least of solutions and social model looking at integration like bringing people together so the cultural model we're thinking about the innovation and design that but we need to bring all the citizens together it's not about the patients or the elderly but it's actually all the citizens from different age group from different background coming together as to create this new culture um, so we've been working on this old school, which is this new concept of culture um, institutes that bringing different generation of people looking at aging different. Yeah, 如果所有人都要都可以一起學老,如果正面的心態去諗諗老齡去諗一些新的方案給我們未來一個叫超老齡的社會。動作做得好一點,他就講就話這些文件其實就叫做drill了。某程度上這件事是可以給一個機會去體驗到,就算你知道有條文,有些事你做了都未必會成功,可能你要試很多次才可以做到這件事。We see things differently, I think so. But I can't say much about it because I'm not that old yet. The fact that a lot of old people like to try stuff, and I think personally I've also seen that even with my grandparents, like they don't, um, they don't give up very easily. Very interested to know that這件事就令我們達不到一個很好的朋友的境界方式 so um, I'm really happy to announce that our old school have just been uh, one of the finalists into the Golden Pin Design Award in Taiwan, which is uh, only nine um, projects from Hong Kong was in the final list. So I think this is a really encouraging message for design that we really bringing a new perspective, but not traditionally bringing just problem solving or solution for these social issues, but it's actually bringing into very fun tiers of the the issues that what is aging, especially in our society, in a Chinese, much more traditional society, how can we bring everyone together thinking differently? And so this is back to what Enable Foundation is about, designed by people. So we go out to do a lot of design research with older people who have no more about aging than us. And then we bring it back to the public and engaging young people, engaging those who haven't know about aging or don't care about aging. And then we design together for everyone, for our future. So this is what we've been talking a lot about dementia as one of the big topics that we're working on. Um, so in this um, project, we've really bringing cost disciplinary working together. So we've been engaging um, dementia service um, 
like providers, like they uh, like from medical doctors, nurses to occupational therapists or social workers. And how can we see their work as a service innovation? But then we as a designers, design researcher working with them and together we're going to develop some social innovation for our future society. So it's really a, um, laying out as a cross disciplinary, very clear defining role. So we working with um, 10 different uh, NGO in Hong Kong, they are really major player in the dementia care service and they're really doing a lot of really good work on service innovation. And we learn so much from them. So what we bring to them is this of like uh, what we call the five I process, which is a moderate uh, is a modified pr uh, design thinking process that we've been using a lot, which is like the eyes like immersive idealization intervention. But we also add this design research element, which is we investigate with them together. We hopefully we can implement with them together when they are doing really amazing surface innovation. But how can our design can be part of the their service in the future. So we're working together to bring a new uh, Dementia Hong Kong into the new era. So we're looking at Dementia Surface, which is existing, but also topic with different NGO because they have different way of working. Uh, they're working in different labor in Hong Kong. So from Sartin to New Territories to Hong Kong Island, there's different neighborhood that we also engage local citizens that we're bringing new um, tactics to how can they deal with dementia. So we bring in this uh, concept about dementia objects and things that we you saw in the in the beginning of the talk, which is how we bring this speculative design concept into this new empathy tools. And we have done a project like the dementia home, engaging young people to understand dementia and also different dementia symptoms, and also visualizing dementia through a really interesting uh, way of just looking at symptoms. But then what we really focus on this new phase of our project is we've been developing empathy and stimulating tools uh, for general public and young citizens and workers. But then I think in order to promote this dementia culture, I think it's so important to really develop this diagnosis and awareness tools with public and also with patients and workers. But more important for the future, the service innovation, we want to develop training and treatment tools that can be used in the future of our city dementia care service. So from um, medical model to social model, we really want to create this cultural model of dementia. So this is what we call people innovation, which is how our uh, Chinese name in transfer, which is about citizens innovation. So it's designed by people with dementia. So we went to observe and collect a lot of story from the carers and also directly with people with dementia. But then we design with social workers, occupational therapy nurses, and then we're working to them together to look at the future service. But then the, the purpose and the goal is designed for our future self. So, but more important that we, because we engaging different disciplines. So it's not easy that, that we just say, oh, designer go to work with a nurse or go work, work with an occupational therapist. It's not, it's, there's a lot of misunderstanding and miscommunication between disciplines. So this is some of the tools that we have designed to engage our collaborators, which is from the social and the medical world. And how can they use metaphor like designers? How can they do mapping like what we've been working on in studio? And also how can they putting themselves into the things that they have identified and then make interesting conversation with things. Um, so this is uh, the metaphor that they've been making uh, using Lago as a, as a block to really making their ideas of what is dementia, but also looking at mapping of things that they've been using intensively in their service in their everyday life. But also a lot of the objects they've been using in their service now for people with dementia. And then together we have collect all their story and analyze them and doing different mapping. Uh, also with some of our students that this summer they're working with a different NGO that we put together all the ideas from our citizens, from professional citizens and also from our young citizens together. And then we did a public showcase to showcase to other public that they can understand more how this new approach can be bringing a new ideas of dementia. So this is what we have just finished um, in September, our show 
showcase of co-creation and bringing a, a more new discussion between design and social service and also the general public. <clears throat> and also we've been sharing a workshop with them about like this uh, mapping and also this uh, manifesto uh, mapping of multi-perspective and meaning. What is meaning? How can we co-create meaning? And so, yes, good timing. Um, so thank you again for inviting me. And um, this is an interesting discussion and is an ongoing reflection of how design practice can respond to different uh, social issues. So, but design by people for people is really something in our practice. And hopefully um, this design for our future self is something I learned from my mentor in um, 20 years ago. And I hope this can be passed to you guys and further develop it in to Hong Kong context and working together for our future self. And do subscribe our YouTube channel and your support will give us more exciting ideas and new way of thinking. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yankee Lee. Uh, may we now invite uh, Mr. Michael Chen for sharing on the design thinking as an academic direction. Michael, please. So, hello. So, uh, so thank you for coming, students. And also, uh, definitely I have to thank you, uh, Professor Lin Connor to have a very uh, in-depth talk about uh, what's happened now in, in UK and how um, nationally they can uh, work together with the uh, citizen to look into the, not a problem, but uh, how aging can change in a different way. So, and also uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Yankee So. Uh, not only her talk, also, so she gave uh, the Dimensia Hong Kong projects uh, collaborate to our school. So I don't know, maybe some students here uh, have the chance to uh, work in as a IA into these uh, projects, but uh, we will also have uh, more like uh, school projects working together with them. So, and also um, she will have an exhibition on Dimersia project that coming out from this uh, Hong Kong Dimersia projects. And I hope I can bring uh, these uh, uh, innovative uh, products coming to our school. So let's see. Okay. Uh, so I think um, why we have this uh, lecture uh, more than uh, for a few years, I hope it can continue more, is to bring in what is um, uh, designed for well-being. Yeah. So we start from design thinking, which is a tools, and now we, we, we go into what, what is well-being design. So as a designer or the um, designer in the future, so I think uh, we not only design things for pretty or to make things more expensive, but uh, actually designer can help the society, can change the world. So we can see different example and I make some advertisement for tomorrow lecture. And the day after we have designed this exhibition that uh, you will see how designer can change in the world, addressing different questions. And uh, Friday also we have lecture from Tsinghua University and see how Chi uh, mainland also concerned about healthcare and see how they, uh, they plan to solving some uh, social or some well-being issues. So uh, may I start? <laughs> because I only have 10 minutes. Okay, so what, what can I do? Thank you. Let's see. Okay, so uh, majorly, I, I want to introduce what, uh, what is happening here in Hong Kong DI. So let's see, which button? This one seems not working. I'll have to point to you. <laughs> oh, okay. So designer, you need patience, huh? Okay, good. 
Can I start? Oh, you press for me? Not yet, okay. So I, I, I hope you see that there is a new world coming and uh, when you guys uh, will be part of it. So do, do not uh, do help uh, the world when you become a designer. So uh, maybe we start from here first, from education. For, from uh, I think three years or four years ago, we start our design thinking team and want to introduce design thinking to the institute. So, and uh, actually we do a uh, numbers of achievement. Can I? <laughs> okay, well, can you press for me? Okay, yes. So up to now for three years, we, we have a uh, few achievements. So I think the most important to have the ethic academic development that can uh, uh, into your curriculum. And, and the other is the professional training. So not only the student in the school, we also want to teach people outside. And the third one is the international knowledge exchange. That's what we are now doing because you have to learn from others or hopefully we can teach others something that we learn. And the last one is the project. So, and uh, you can see like Yankee and um, Professor Connor that uh, they really have to do something that can come out to the world that people can use. So we also hope that uh, our institute can do real projects that can help people. Yeah. So for this four, five, uh, four years, we have um, have a professional certificate, we have staff development, and I think all the students, you now can have the creative and design thinking core module, start from last year. So every people learn design thinking. So, yeah. So let's see, so uh, we have, um, yeah, the design thinking core module. So every student now you have to have 39 hours of core module. And I have a good news to you that uh, we have a new classroom. It's called ThinkPorn. Hopefully it will open maybe next month that equipped it with uh, funny furniture and a lot of uh, IT technology things that uh, enhance the design thinking. So uh, possibly it's for, for some coming students, but you guys can have a look. <laughs> okay, because I know that you, most of you are from year two, right? Also, we, we hopefully teaching these uh, design thinking to other professionals. So we have four professional certificate courses, which is 72 hours. And uh, so after you graduate, you can also um, uh, take this course, huh? Okay. And uh, our head of department, Keith here, so he designed uh, design thinking tools for us. So it's not only for the student, but also can for the profession. So we have a uh, creative card. So if you're stuck, you just pick up from the creative card and you will become creative. <laughs> Hope you can work it out. Huh? So also uh, we train people outside. So uh, uh, also we train our, our staff here. So every student, every teacher here know design thinking and hope that really can create something change for our institute in the future that we use design thinking to think about the projects we are doing, okay? And uh, hopefully next year we, we can have a, a online course design thinking platform. So it's a dream and hope the dream can come true very soon. And uh, so we do professional training 
not for our staff, but also for majorly um, for the civil servants. So you can see like uh, uh, Labor Department, ICAC and uh, Lands Department, Hong Kong Observatory. So all, um, they, they come to us and uh, so we deliver design thinking and hopefully they can use this design thinking to solve their, their problems, okay? And then we work together with PMQ to have the train the trainer workshop. So we train the uh, teacher there. So the teacher will train the primary school student. So we hopefully it can continue in the coming years. And then we have the international exchange. And uh, last year we go to uh, Manchester Metropolitan University. And um, before all the airplane goes down, so almost the last trip <laughs> the student can go out, sorry. And uh, they learn a lot. They solve some problem on health, place, work, food, and network. Okay. And then we have our HKDI Inspire. So what you enjoy now. So remember today is the first day. Please come for the coming three, three days. So we have different speakers, different topic. And uh, so we, we work together with uh, TU Delft and also um, to have this uh, Hong Kong DI Inspire last year. And this is what we are now, in, now doing, okay. And then, so remember another advertisement again for uh, Thursday. So we have the Design Dust Exhibition opening. So you students may find some interesting uh things happening in the exhibition area so that is this uh, exhibition okay and lastly so i introduced some projects so uh at the beginning we work together with applied science for this utensil projects for airlines so because the, the problem is that uh, when you fly from one place to another all the plastic utensil that uh, on the airplane have to throw away even this use or not use, because they don't want to carry germs from other country back to your own country. So, so it's a very big problem in environmental. So we collaborate with applying science to think, is that possible to have the, the holding, the, the utensil that holding the food can also eat? Some great solution there, say like they, 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 they think about using um, a spoon made of sugar. So after using it, they can put it into the hot coffee and the sugar will, the spoon will melt into the sugar, into the coffee and drink, drink it up. There's also some interesting idea coming out. And uh, last year we have another project with the um, young female drug abuser and to, we do research together with a student to understand the, um, the needs of the, uh, 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 people that uh, have to uh, stay there, rehabilitate in this uh, uh, institute. And actually the student find some real problem. So remember design thinking, we firstly find the problem, define the problem, and they define really good that uh, they find that they have maybe some kind of uh, misconnection in between the elder uh, sister that, uh, staying there to the newcomers. So they design uh, tools. Yeah, so design a game, a kind of card game that doing ice breaking, that when you take a card and you have to introduce yourself, you have to take a card and then maybe you have to serve one of the people there. So it, it helped a lot that um, they can have uh, this kind of sisterhood coming out after playing the game. So, so sometimes solution is not difficult, it's not high tech, it's not rocket. Sometimes a card can help a lot. So it's a, it's a uh, senior uh, classmate project, huh? it's not some great designer project. So don't worry, you guys all can design if you have the heart. And uh, this is what um, Yankee had talked a lot about. This is the collaboration now happening. So hope uh, some of your students can uh, join, join her and, and uh, help the dementia people this year. 
And uh, this is some new new thing coming up. And uh, so we also now collaborate with the Hong Kong Society for the Blind. So, and see how we can, our we designer can help uh, 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 the blind people. And uh, actually they have quite a number of interesting uh, way of thinking uh, how to help them. Say like they have a, a blind factory. So uh, I think uh, communication design uh, uh, teachers and also students want to think about something that help the blind people to uh, can make it manufacture it in the prime factory because now they are only doing folding the cardboard or some very uh, low uh, what can I say is is uh, not 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 much pride inside so we want to design something that they they are proud of making it but that that come to an interesting thing is we never do design because of the design process. We always do design for the outcome. So this time is a good chance for the, not only the, the lecturer, but also the student thinking how blind people can manufacture something. So closing the eye and you can, you know, floating something and making something out. I think this is an interesting project. And uh, okay. And actually we also have some, some new projects, which is, which are, quite exciting. The other one is uh, actually uh, some uh, medical um, uh, institute calling me and uh, they want to want us to work together with them to see how we can use AR or VR technology to reduce the pain during the operation of the surgery. So it will happen this year. So we, we hope that we can do something uh, interesting coming out. At the start, we're thinking about a game. So when you are doing maybe uh, not, maybe not necessary surgery, maybe some tooth um, picking or some uh, dentist operation. So you can play game instead of you know every time you go to see a dentist it's always like even the, the, the doctor haven't touched you you're already thinking it's uh, very painful so let's see can can designer helping in that way and and the other project can be interesting is another uh, the psychology uh, department from hong kong university so so they also finding us and see how we can help the young people to they call it Decency Netizen Association Alliance. What does that mean? Is that uh, they, they, they want to uh, collaborate with us to design something to help the young people, maybe the primary school or the secondary school student to regulate the, the time to play video game. <laughs> so I don't know whether we designer can help, but by design thinking by our um, imagination. I think we can do something out. I don't know, but uh, just hope so. So let's see. So I hope all you guys can um, join this new stream, new trend, new direction. See how we can really not only design something for beauty or for higher cost, but for the society. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, let's now uh, yeah. connect. Uh, connect with the Professor Corner and Dr. Yankee Lee again for the panel oh, discussion. Okay. I have to see. Okay, so I am the uh, host oh. <laughs> to start some question, maybe. So, how about um, Professor Lin Corner? So, hi, Yankee. Hi, hi, Professor. Hi, Michael. Hello, Professor Lin Corner. <laughs> Hello. So nice to see you again. I think I met you in um, UK a few years ago. <laughs> Indeed, hello again. Yeah, and Yankee, I met you a few months ago, right? <laughs> you know, <laughs> no, but you, you two both are now in UK. I hope I'm, uh, but, no, but I, I'm uh, in quite Hong a serious um, uh, I'm in Hong Kong. pandemic uh, situation, right? 
Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Maybe I just start some question, uh, casual random question, or, or on the floor, if you have question, you can raise your hand. Uh, no, I, I actually um, very interested in um, you both to carry a same topic is uh, kind of like by the people for the people or from or on or whatever with and uh, so any um, but but I think it's quite difficult so because I think we, we I, I find difficult to do that kind of research how to how to know the people how to know the needs especially now the day uh, we are occupied by all these social media and all these uh, things from the internet, which uh, I don't know, is it kind of have the uh, 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 same, same, same temperature or something like that. <laughs> so, so um, can uh, any ideas that we can break through things and know the real things so we can uh, buy the people doing the, uh, we can really uh, know the people. Mm -hmm. Or, or uh, Professor, you, Professor Connor, so you have any, uh, what, yeah. I, I can see you have a very big uh, crown of, uh, not database, but, but uh, member that, that joined you. So that's very yeah. good, but. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so we have. Um, for the student will be have... difficult. Well, we have a big um, network of um, users um, who uh, come through our network called Voice, and uh, that's supported by a digital online platform and an app. So um, it makes it very, very easy for people to get involved, and for students and for other, you know, for other researchers to connect to people. So that's the way we put up an opportunity through the digital platform. And then uh, people can get involved on their own terms in their own time. So it's a super way to kind of connect students to um, people with the lived experience. Um, and also through collating research evidence and uploading it to the platform, um, we can make sure that, um, you know, people can access uh, very complicated data sets and very complicated disparate information on needs and, and access it in a very, very easy manner. So, um, you know, we're, we're setting up voice internationally, um, setting up in Australia, and perhaps we could explore setting up voice with you guys in Hong Kong. Oh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's good. So, so people uh, there, they will really speak out what is their problem and there will people try to solve them or, or what, mm -hmm. how it uh, operates. Yeah, so, um, so people come forward and say, you know, where, where they are finding particular challenges, what are their needs, and also what their unmet needs are. Um, and then we work to collate some research evidence to say, OK, what do we know about this problem so that we don't reinvent the wheel and duplicate effort? And then it's about matching that to um, uh, teams like yourselves, to uh, designers who can perhaps design new products and services, but also to businesses who can help to bring that product to life and bring that product to market. Um, mm -hmm. Because our success is when the products and services that you guys do such a wonderful job of designing actually can be found in somebody's home and it's making a real and lasting difference to the experience of living with for example um, from the wonderful work on dementia um, so it's it's really about very practically listening to what people's needs are and then collectively together um, coming you know all, all different perspectives all different sectors to say well okay how can we take this challenge and actually design and bring to market products and services that are going to make a difference. I see. So how about Dr. Lee? So seems you are doing more on a few research type of uh, uh, knowing the people, the needs. So, so any obstacle or any uh, way to break through that obstacle? So our student, I think this not only the social distance, but psychological distance for maybe even for me to, you know, approaching a stranger and talk to them about death or, you know, about your disease or something like that. Yeah, um, I think uh, Professor Connor um, talked something 
very interesting. Uh, so I have been working in, in London for a long time. And I think for me coming back to Hong Kong, the cultural shock is really lack of trust. So I think it would be really good to have a voice like platform in Hong Kong, but they need to have a different parameter because what we find out is people generally in Hong Kong, they not trusting the system and they not, um, they may not say what we expect from them. So the voice is, is sometimes can be like, like you say, you, you still go out to really like justify it. Is, is it like worth to explore? So in Hong Kong, the situation is much more complicated. What I find, um, people not generally like used to giving voice. So it's a very different way to do it. So what we find out is um, we building trust with the professional first. I think that is also an important part because we did um, cost generations in the beginning and we find in the interview you saw that a lot of misunderstanding between the generation and then the, the older one doesn't trust the young one and the young one don't want to share their, their view. So there have been a lot of problem. And so what we find out is um, in order to make things implement, we need to work with professionals, which is, I think the cross-disciplinary uh, boundary is, um, may, is not easy, but it's much more effective in Hong Kong because uh, Hong Kong social service, I mean, there's very, very well developed. So for example, just dementia service, there's so much like resources have been put in. So I think we just don't want to reinvent the whole wheel. So I think for a social innovation perspective, we look at a whole system change. So we look at people who actually holding all the resources for services in Hong Kong. And I'm working with them. And I think building the trust is still a big issues and hurdles. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's, it's very interesting if the voice platform can be happen in Hong Kong, we'll see what happens. People may not say something that <laughs> uh, we expected, but it it's, will be interesting to see. But also the other thing, um, we have been talking a lot with the older people. I think the older people generally want to help. They thinking they want to contribute. I think this is also a cultural difference. So they're not as individuals like those I met in UK, so on one hand, they are very, they're very keen to contribute, but others, on the other level, they may have this sort of a hierarchy that they want to tell, they want to tell the young people what they need to do. So there's a lot of cultural issues here, like, which is interesting to really tackle on it and build on it in a different way. Mm -hmm. mm, okay. Yeah, but I, I think uh, uh, Yang you are quite successful I think a few years ago to work together with our school and have uh, built up a elderly society that uh, I, I think elderly people uh, really like to share, but uh, you have to find a pathway to to induce them. Yeah. 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 Okay, actually uh, we have a question from the floor. So for both of you, <laughs> mm -hmm. so this uh, speaks like, uh, from, from your experience, how do we avoid design decisions end up serving the ones who shout the loudest during <laughs> engaging design process? So, so, mm. so it's a great so, question. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, any well, I, idea? I answer, so, I how to answer, balance think, uh, different yeah. voice? So, so, yeah, especially. Your your uh, institute is called Voice. <laughs> How to balance the yeah. loud voice and the low voice and the high voice? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a great question, and um, <laughs> yes, definitely. you know we, we we work very hard to make sure, as I know that um, everyone does, to make sure that we're not just listening to the loudest voice, and uh, we're also not bringing through kind of um, very you know wealthy retired individuals who can have got time as well to kind of contribute ideas what's really important in any engagement is that um, you have the mechanisms um, to reach the people who are underserved and perhaps have the greatest need if that makes sense so um, from voice we have a, a very uh, strong strategy on making sure that we are involving people who are from areas of high deprivation 
for example, and that we are both designing um, and bringing to market products and services that are accessible and within their price range and within their kind of um, um, you know, accessibility. Um, so it's a great question and um, there's no kind of um, simple way to do it. I think it needs resource, it needs um, join up and collaboration because no one organisation can do this on their own. Um, and um, we, we also need to be aware of digital exclusion, that actually um, it's super important to continue to have the, the, the community engagement as well as the individual engagement through um, digital means. But um, what is important is that we have the range of ways we don't reinvent the wheel and duplicate effort, but we work collaboratively together um, to make sure that if we know about those needs, we share them and then we can co-design and co-deliver great products and services. Okay. So how about Yankee? So any idea? Uh, that's that's for, also, for I think for <laughs> Professor Corner, if what I find in Hong Kong is even more difficult because designer and people always have this client and designer perspective. So if they come in as a client, that's they always making the, 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 the loudest voice because they come in to tell you what you need to do as a designers. Mm -hmm. So it's a design service. But I think what we really try to do is we use creative facilitation. So we make sure the role is very clear. So this is a collaborative project. There's no one making one voice, but it's, we are collecting different voices. And then we are the people who facilitating it and also collecting different voice. And then we make sure everyone hear each other. I think that is important, mm -hmm. but in Hong Kong is also a difficult task because designer as a professions is always have this service model that we want walk in and we listen to a client. So it's also a, a new challenge when we go into working with um, like the dementia care service, a lot of big NGO, they, when we walk in, they will just say, oh, you guys are designer coming to design for us. No, 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 no we're not designed for you. We design yeah. with you. With or you. Even, yeah, so it, this is why I have this talk that because we really want to make it really clear from the beginning. So this is something it's been interesting discussion and need to be alert because there have been a lot of social structure quite fixed in our society. And uh, we've been just like gradually breaking it one by one, but then there's always a reminder coming in because always will be a, a big CEO coming in like you guys are designing for us, like no. <laughs> so it's, yes. it's, yeah, it's a good question, but it's a, also a tough question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, so, ah, so, question from the floor. Mm. Yes, uh, please have a... Uh, just to follow on from uh, Yankee. Um, yeah, we, design is still very much a service in this industry. I think we, we were a manufacturing industry before. I'm making things, I mean service and then what are we moving into is it knowledge that we're dealing with now because it seems that you know research when research is involved then knowledge generation is very important as part of the design process uh but actually my question is about some other thing but i just wanted to respond <laughs> to uh yankee's comment about design being a service in this industry um it seems like i don't want to generalize but uh professor corner you know presented a a user-centered kind of approach to the work. Whereas Yankee, again, you know, not to generalize, but uh, a lot of what you've shown um, is about um, uh, speculative design or critical design. Uh, uh, it seems that there are, you know, these two approaches are, are, are slightly different. You, you engage with users definitely for both, for, you know, both approaches. Uh, for the speculative, speculative design, it seems that um, the creation of awareness uh, was the main goal, uh, it seems. W would you say that? Or, or, I mean, how do we reconcile the differences between these two approaches uh, when designing for the future? Uh, how, how are we kind of, how do you think these two approaches are moved, uh, like the direction the directions these two approaches are moving into uh, as we look into the future. Yeah. So okay, I, maybe maybe Yankee, you, you yeah. uh, take this question this time. Is, is it Keith? Ask the question. Yes, yeah, it's Keith, right? Yeah. Hi, 
Is that Keith asked the question? <laughs> yes, it's me. You recognize my voice. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Hi, uh, Yankee. Hi. I'm sit um, back down now. Okay. No, I, I'm, I'm so excited to see Professor Corner work because this is where I grew up with. This, this is the, the user center design that I've been working in the past 20 years. Um, but I, I must say, um, that's why my talk today is like, okay, in user center design, we talk about designing with people. Um, but then when you're actually in the field, when you're with them, it's not easy. And I think this is why I also pick up what I learned and also been really admiring the uh, speculative design because they are doing great job and making big um, voice. And um, so I thought this doesn't really matter what I'm using. I'm really looking for design for this very particular purpose. So I need, I, I need young people to think about dementia. So I will use different approach, different way to really look at what they need and then design for them, with them, by them. So I think this is something for me is, it's good that you, you raise all the term, but for me it's more important about the practice. Um, I'm not saying my work is speculative design because no, I don't think, yeah, I'm not one, I'm mixing of different, mixture of different approach. So how about um, Professor Connor? So any ideas on the future? Of yeah, no, I mean, I, I, think, um, I think it's just, uh, it, it's a great question. I think where we are particularly wanting to push is not just looking at the individual, but looking at their ecosystem, looking at the stakeholders around them. Um, so that we're not just designing, for example, with a person with dementia, but also um, designing for um, the, the family carers, for example, for um, the urban environment so that um, we, we kind of have that kind of a broader approach. Um, and I do think that, you know, what I love about the work in terms of the, the speculative design is also that the, the experience of people today is not going to be the experience in the future, obviously. And so actually we need to kind of look ahead and think through kind of, you know, what are the future oriented approaches that actually will will actually help us to challenge the assumptions and conceptions. Um, and so um, I think there's a real place for almost a merging of the two perspectives really um, that um, it's super important that we look ahead super important that we consider not just the person with dementia but also the people who are having to continue to work to care and what their future is as well um, so I think emerging of those perspectives is perhaps um, something that, that that is exciting about this space in the future yeah, that's great so any more questions on the floor so if not, uh, any question uh, you want to raise, uh, Professor Connor? Or... So if not, so maybe uh, we have uh, today a good day. So how is the weather in UK? Good, good weather? It's very bright and sunny today. So, okay, uh, that that's great, yeah. <laughs> You're so in let's, Newcastle, uh... right? <laughs> huh? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, in Newcastle, yeah. 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 We, we are waiting a typhoon coming, so, so still, still okay now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so have a nice day, and thank you again, Professor Lin Connor and uh, Dr. Yankee Lee, thank for you, this uh, first pleasure. Talk. So, pleasure. so hope you all too, also, or others, uh, audience, can join the lectures uh, in the coming days. So, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.